Harry Met, Virtual Traveller, and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that invites you to rewild yourself through story by exploring nature, folklore, and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson, and I'm an author and professional storyteller. Welcome to season four, and the first theme for this season, as chosen by patrons, is the horned gods. In this episode, I will explore the Prince of the Forest, which is, of course, the stag, and its associated folklore, gods and mythology. Before I start this episode, I do have a little bit of news. For those of you that haven't yet seen my posts through my other platforms, the last two months have been full of book writing and learning new stories. But as always, life doesn't necessarily take you down the paths you were expecting it to. Sometimes a new path reveals itself in the forest, and this month... That's exactly what happened. I've been offered a job in heritage and landscape interpretation. It's a temporary contract for nine to 12 months and, well, it's an amazing opportunity for me to use what I've learned over the last six years about nature, landscape, story and heritage interpretation and then build on that with a team of individuals who are working in the same area. Because this is a full-time position, but only temporary, I will be continuing with my existing storytelling commitments in the form of the shows and events. Plus, how could I ever stop telling stories, to be honest? However, this does mean that I will be taking a little break from the podcast to give me a chance to see what my workload is like and how I can balance that against my current commitments. I hope to be back with the podcast in the new year, if not before. But for now, grab yourself a cuppa, find a comfy spot and come with me into my local woodland where deer, rabbits, marbled whites and wrens roam free. As I walk into the little woodland that I sit in, which is um, an old um, Christmas tree plantation, very small, uh, I walk through a walk through a meadow which uh, has very, very tall grass in it. So we always come through with tall boots because I know there's a lot of deer um, in this field and uh, hares. And this field is full, they've turned it to wildflowers, so it's full of oxide daisies, little thistles, lots of different types of grass dock and I don't know whether you can hear it because it might be quite difficult for the recorder to pick it up but it is just churring with little crickets at the moment and there are little black beetles everywhere along with ladybirds and moths marbled white butterflies it's just absolute pleasure to stand here and a privilege got fresh green teasel and as I walk into the pine wood I can smell the pine. It's become so familiar to me now that actually it took uh, a friend to point out to me that this place did smell of pine because it, I come here so often it's become just something that I'm used to. Find a female pheasant feather on the ground Thistles as tall as my head. Overgrown hawthorn. There's even a cotoneaster here, which is quite random. You hear the pigeons. They don't need to make that really loud flapping noise. That's an alarm call for them. But like I say, they'll be back once I sit and stop making noise.
So I tend to um, sit in the same place each time. Because then I can get to know what comes and goes in this area. Uh, and the visitors that I often get while I'm sat here is occasionally you'll get a deer just on the edge of the pine wood. Might not get that today because it's quite windy today, so they'll be able to, uh, they'll, they'll know I'm here, they'll be able to smell that I'm here. Um, on a slightly sunnier day with less wind, they might not notice that I'm here if I'm very quiet. There is an enormous buck rabbit that does come and visit occasionally and he doesn't care at all that I'm here. So we might see him today. Patch where I'm sat has got little tiny baby brambles and ivy. It's mainly moss, lots and lots of pine needles old branches that have come off the trees in high winds and it's like a little glade so there's a, a small patch in the canopy above so actually you get a nice bit of light in this bit because there's a gap for the sun to get in so you can watch the clouds scutter by above and there's plenty to see even if the deer and the rabbits don't come and say hello because down in the undergrowth there is a lot of uh, insects um, beetling about, wood lice, snails. Um, I've even found a little uh, patch where clearly a, a thrush comes and eats its breakfast as there's been a little uh, snail graveyard. So yes, this is a hive of activity, this little pine copse. So I've been sat in the wood for a good half an hour. Heard lots of birds, wrens, chiff chaffs, magpies, pigeons, <laughs> all the usual suspects. But uh, the old buck bunny hasn't come to say hello today and neither have the deer. But nonetheless, it's a lovely place to sit. Breathe in the pine trees and recharge the batteries. I hope you've enjoyed this wander in the woods with me and I hope you can join me next time. Whilst I wasn't joined by any deer during that little trip to my local woodland, I have had several encounters with deer in that area. During the autumn, they are easily seen grazing by the edges of the woods that back onto the fields of arable crops. And this year, a few times in the spring, I've noticed the odd head pop up above the long grass of the fields which are being renatured in preparation for the farm becoming organic. Some of you will also remember my posts on Instagram about a deer which comes and barks at me while I'm sat on my sunrise visuals early in the morning. 
You can find a little video of this deer in the highlights on my Instagram and it will be featured in my next book, which I'm currently writing. It's quite a character. Moving back to the wilds of the forest, ever since William the Conqueror first sectioned off the land and created forests for the express purpose of hunting, there have of course been poachers. Now the definition of poacher really does depend on where you sit on who owns the land. Basically, William's forests excluded commoners from what was once common land, places where they could graze their sheep, collect estovers, which is basically fallen wood that they can use for their fires, and perhaps catch the odd rabbit for the pot. This was just a tacit agreement that we had as a community. Respect the land and the land will look after you. However, William's sectioning off of the land meant new laws, and new laws meant that many were faced with the choice of whether or not to break those laws in order to survive. Most of the time, these poachers were just people trying to feed their families, but often the punishment if they were caught was death. The following folk song is about a woman who is pleading for the life of her partner, Georgie. He's been caught hunting in the King's Forest. It makes a great story, and I've made some adaptions to the original song, which makes it a little easier for me to sing it. As I rode over London Bridge one misty morning early, I overheard a crying girl pleading for the life of a Georgie. Now Georgie robbed no storehouses, he never murdered any. He only shot a king's white deer, all four to feed his family. He never stole, he never slew, he never murdered any to spare the life of my poor Georgie. Then the judge looked over his left shoulder and thus he say to Georgie, By your confession you shall hang and the Lord have mercy upon ye. Then Georgie he looked round at the court and he saw his dearest Polly. He said, my love, you've come too late for I'm condemned already. He never stole, he never slew, he never murdered any to spare the life of my poor Georgie. Then Georgie he walked around the court and said farewell to many, but the leaving of his own true love that grieved him worst of any. Let Georgie hang in golden chains, his crimes they were not many. He only shot a king's white deer, all four to feed his family. He never stole, he never slew, he never murdered any to spare the life of my poor Georgie. As I previously mentioned, William the Conqueror created forests for the primary purpose of hunting game. This included, amongst many things, deer. These swathes of land also included farmland and villages, as well as the forest itself. This meant that anyone living within this area also fell under these rules. They were no longer allowed to hunt on the land or use it for the purposes they had been previously, such as grazing or collecting estovers. As you might imagine, King William loved hunting, and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle states that William the Conqueror preserved the hearts and boars and loved the stags as much as if he was their father. So what was so special about the stag? The stag and the deer have long played a part in British and indeed European history, appearing in many Paleolithic cave paintings and later our spoken legend and mythology, and often morphing into the horned gods that this episode seeks to connect with. But before I delve deeper into the forest to meet the stag, let's take a look at the types of deer found in this country. According to the British Deer Society website, there are six different deer species in Britain. These are red deer, roe deer, seeker deer, muntjac deer, fallow deer and Chinese water deer. The ones you may be most familiar with are red, roe, 
fallow and muntjac. We have plenty of roe deer in this part of the country and in fact the antlers I wear for my Christmas shows are roe deer. If you're interested, I've put a picture of them and how they were created on the Patreon in one of my behind the scenes posts. The terminology used when referring to these deer can change depending on the species. For example, male red and seeker deer are known as stags and the females hinds and the young as calves. Roe deer are bucks, does and kids respectively. And the other three, muntjacs, Chinese water deer and fallow, are bucks, does and fawns. So if our deer are known as stags, hinds, calves, bucks, does, fawns, kids, what's a heart? A heart is used to refer to all male deer over five years old. And it is used in particular in connection with the red deer, which is the biggest of the six. A stag that is less than a year old is called a calf. And then, less than two years, a brocket. Less than three, a spayard. Then less than four, a staggard. And then finally, a stag, until once it is over five years old, it becomes a heart. The king would have been looking to hunt a heart in particular, and one that was hale and hearty, no pun intended, so that it provided plenty of meat for his feast. You can find out a lot more about these wonderful creatures via the British Deer Society website and there's a link in the show notes if you are interested. As much as I would like to talk to you more about these deer, this is a folklore and story podcast, so let's move on and take a look at the history and lore of deer. In the medieval beastery reproduced by Richard Barber, the text notes that the Latin name for the deer is cervidae and that this comes from the Greek word cerriton, which means horns. The medieval beastery states that if a deer is ill, then it will lure a snake out of the undergrowth, breathe on it to neutralise the venom, and then eat it. It was also thought that deer could heal arrow wounds with a herb called dittany, which is native to Greece. The beastery goes on to say how the sound of panpipe music will mesmerise deer, and that they will run with the wind if they hear dogs, so that their scent is carried away with them. It was also thought that deer carried the secret to eternal youth, as the beastery notes that after eating the aforementioned snake, the deer would go and drink from a fresh spring and become rejuvenated. As for humans using the antlers for medicine, it is considered that the right antler is better medicine than the left. Stags are not themselves mythical beings. However, they do turn up occasionally as parts of mythical beings. A periton is a half deer, half bird and Sibyl of Atria, a prophetess from ancient Greece, foretold that these periton would destroy a city. It was also believed that the periton's shadow as it fell was in fact the shadow of a man, suggesting that the periton was actually once a man. It was further believed that the periton had to kill humans in order to regain their soul. In China, the Chinese unicorns had the body of a deer and the tail of an ox and the hooves of a horse. It brings nothing but good omens and it is known as the Kit Ilin. In modern day conversation, we use stags to refer to men in certain situations, such as out on a stag night or, as it's known in the US, a bachelor party. A stag might also be the word that's used to refer to a person who buys new shares on the stock exchange with the express intention of selling them on for a quick profit. As you might expect, throughout history, the stag has lent itself to our culture as a very masculine symbol. They are a symbol of strength and fertility, wildness and mystery. The shedding and regrowth of their antlers could be seen as emblematic of the circle of life and rebirth. This is further borne out by the fact that they are connected with the Norse creation myth. There are four stags that nibble at the leaves of the world tree. Their names are Dane, Dvalin, Dunyir and Aratha. They can be found, as mentioned, nibbling at the leaves, flowers and branches of Idrisil, the world tree. These four stags are thought to represent the four winds, or perhaps even the passage of time. An ethereal version of the stag, which is seen as magical to this day, is the white heart. And in fact, in some deer parks in this country, you can find some white red deer. They're still red deer, they're just completely white. This white deer represents spirit, liminal space, and in story is often the harbinger of a quest. This is particularly so in Arthurian legend. In China, the white heart is a symbol of immortality. The masculine symbolism of the deer 
is somewhat reversed, though, in the legend of Genghis Khan, as he was said to have been the child of a hind and a blue wolf, representing a strange combination of prey and predator, the hind, or deer, being the prey. And indeed, hinds represent a softer side to the deer's nature. There is the golden hind of Greek myth, which was sacred to Artemis. This hind was also known as the Cyrenian hind, and it is a chaste hind with golden antlers and hooves. In some myths, Artemis has four of these Cyrenian hinds to pull her chariot, and it is said that she found five of them in total, but that she allowed the fifth to remain free so that it could serve as one of the labours of Hercules. In Celtic mythology, the phrase to hunt the hind describes the search for wisdom, and in Celtic folklore, the stag belongs to the fairy folk, and this is very clearly evident in many stories, and even in modern-day interpretations of these folk. We need look no further than the image of Thranduil, the elk-riding elven king, in the film franchise of Tolkien's Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. This has gained the deer the nickname of fairy cattle in the highlands of Scotland. And whilst we're looking at Scottish mythology, if we go back to episode one of season three, you will remember I mentioned that deer are also associated with the Kaliak, an ancient woman of the winter landscape in the highlands. In some stories, she is the keeper of the deer, much like the fairies. In Irish mythology and the stories of Finn, Finn finds an enchanted hind in the forest and takes her back to his palace, where she transforms into Sieve, a beautiful woman, who he then marries, as he do. When he goes away to war, the druid who first placed the curse on Sieve reappears and turns her into a deer once more. She disappears into the forest and later, Whilst he is trying to find Sieve, Finn finds a fawn in the forest who turns out to be his child. Several of the Greek goddesses are associated with hinds. Artemis is probably the most notable, and I've mentioned her before. She is the goddess of the hunt, but she does not appear in the form of a deer. Instead, she has those golden hinds that pull her chariot. A similar goddess in Celtic mythology is Flodai, who is the goddess of the woodland and has a chariot, again, drawn by deer. Flidae, unlike Artemis, who is the goddess of the hunt, is a very sexual being, and it is said that when she is away, her consort needs seven women in her place. Flidae also owns a cow that can provide milk for up to 30 people each day. In story, you'll find a lot of these cows with endless supplies of milk, and they are often associated with creation myths, but these stories are for another day. Now, like I say, there are a lot of goddesses associated with deer, but these goddesses are not horned gods. In fact, the horned gods, they're quite different entities. In the Celtic pantheon, the horned god is one of the most important gods. He is depicted, and he is usually a he, as a stag, goat, bull or ram, depending on where you are in Britain. His image is usually of somebody that is naked, and he sometimes appears with a serpent that has a ram's head again linking deer and stags to snakes. He also wears a heavy necklace known as a torque, or he holds it in his hand. Like the stag, this god represents fertility and strength, and he is seen as a warrior. One of the most oldest and famous depictions of the horned god is on the inside of the Gundestrap cauldron, which dates from the 1st century BCE. This was discovered in Jutland, Denmark, and currently resides in the National Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen. A slightly more ambiguous god is Pan, appearing as cloven-hooved always, but with antlers in some cases, or in other cases just simply as a half-goat, half-man. He is often found in the company of nymphs, and frequently infers a hedonistic lifestyle. In the main, though, Pan is more goat than deer, and this has led to him in some cases being confused with the imagery surrounding the Christian devil. Interestingly, not only is he a god of the wild and domestic animals, but he's also a music deity. He plays the panpipes, which links back to that note in the medieval beasteries that the deers can be mesmerised by panpipes. When the horned god is mentioned, many of us immediately think of the Celtic horned god, Canunus, which is what many people think the Gundestrap cauldron represents. Canunus is the ruler of beasts, protector of the forest and god of plenty. He is seen in human form with stag antlers rising from his head. He is also the Celtic god of the underworld. 
He too occasionally appears with a serpent that has the head of a ram, and he wears the talk around his neck. So it is often assumed that the horn god and Canunus are one and the same. However, I found in my reading that this is not always so. He was thought to mainly have been worshipped in Britain, but when the Christian church started to gain popularity, he, a little like poor old Pan, became demonised. His name can be seen to be derived from the Gaulish word Carnan, meaning horn or antler. Canunas can still be found in stories and lore today, and in fact he appeared as a significant character in the very dark 2017 French-Canadian series Black Spot. I thoroughly enjoyed both seasons of this programme, and it's currently available on Netflix. I've included a link in the show notes in case you're interested. All these antlered gods bring us to Hearn, and it is Hearn's story that I would like to tell you for this episode. Hearn is less of a horned god and more of a horned ghost, and he's said to haunt Windsor Great Park and lead the wild hunt each night. If you're not sure about what the wild hunt is, there are some excellent podcast episodes which you can find on the wild hunt, and I would recommend checking out Mark Norman's episode on the wild hunt uh, on the Folklore Podcast and Holly's episode on on the Wild Hunt, which can be found on the History and Folklore podcast. Should you have the misfortune to happen upon Hearn, you will find him with baying dogs, thundering hooves and rattling chains. He will also be antler-headed. He often appears at times of trouble and civil unrest, and in 1962 some youths who were hanging about in the park at night sounded a hunting horn which was said to goad Hearn. The legend goes that they heard the sound of dogs and hooves pretty quickly after blowing the horn and then witnessed the spectral vision that is Hearn the Hunter. So how did this antlered hunter come to be haunting the park? Well, make yourself comfortable and I'll tell you his tale. William Shakespeare the Merry Wives of Windsor, Act 4, Scene 4. There is an old tale goes that Hearn the Hunter, sometimes a keeper here in Windsor Forest, doth all the winter time at still midnight walk round about an oak with great ragged horns, and there he blasts the tree and takes the cattle, and makes milk keen yield blood, and shakes a chain in a most hideous and dreadful manner. You have heard of such a spirit, and well you know the superstitious idle-headed eld, received and did deliver to our age this tale of Hearn the Hunter for a truth. Hearn was King William's gamekeeper. He was a loyal employee and already one of the king's favourites. So when one day the king was out in the forest hunting a white hart, as kings do, they had been riding for many, many miles and the horses were getting tired. But William knew that that heart was also getting tired and that soon he would be able to corner that animal and have it for his feast. And so it was in a glade when the heart, panting and snorting, could not carry on any further. The king's men had surrounded the heart. King William dismounted, sure that he would be able to dispense with his quarry with little problem. As he approached the stag, though, it had one last attempt at freedom within it, and it lowered its enormous antlers and ran at the king. To all who watched, it looked like that would be it. The king would be done for. But Hearn, as the king's gamekeeper, knew these animals well. He had been riding beside William For many, many years, he'd watched the way he behaved when he'd cornered a stag and he knew how the stag would respond. He knew that this would be what would happen. So it wasn't really much of a surprise, to Hearn at least, 
that he threw himself between the stag and the king. His only thought was to protect William. The stag, of course, gored Hearn, and he was mortally wounded. As well as Hearn, the stag too was done for, for the king's men fell on the stag and finished it. The stag lay bleeding on the ground, its blood mixing with that of Hearn, and William stood over the two of them, looking down at the scene. He had no wish to sacrifice his gamekeeper for this deer, and so he told his men to go and fetch the local druid that lived within the forest. There was a wise, wise man who knew the uses of herbs in healing and salves, and when the druid appeared and saw how mortally wounded Hearn was, he doubted that he would be able to save him. However, he said to the king that there was one way that they could do this, that what had happened was that the stag had taken the strength from Hearn, and so Hearn must take that strength back. They skinned the top of the stag's head and took away the antlers and the skin on the top of it. And to the horror of all that were watching, the druid stitched this skin and stag horns to the top of the dying Hearn's head. Hearn barely stirred. He did not even feel the pain of this operation. And when the druid was done, he picked Hearn up and took him back to his house in the forest. He kept him there for many days, weeks and months. He fed him healing broth, rubbed salves on his wounds, gave him drinks of medicinal herbs. And over time, Hearn did indeed gain his strength back. He would never have been the Hearn he was before this incident. But he was able to return to the king's palace. Before he did that, though, the druid removed the skin and the antlers from his head. The king was feasting when Hearn entered the great hall. He stood up and raised a glass to his new favourite and, well, he could not believe that before him stood Hearn, Hearn who had saved his life. Hearn who had ultimately helped him to bring down the white heart. The king invited him up to his table, sat him beside him. Hearn ate the finest food that evening and every evening thereon. Every hunt, Hearn rode beside the king. Hearn could do no wrong. But over time, a jealousy an envy and a rage pooled inside the stomachs of those that had been there with Hearn that day. Yes, OK, he laid his life down for the king, but did he really deserve this life now? Hearn was nothing before he'd done that. Hearn was just the king's gamekeeper. Yes, he was a very good gamekeeper, but nothing more than that. They were lords. They were barons. Why was he above them? So it was that they went to the druid and they spoke to the druid in the wood and they said to him, what have you done to Hearn? Why have you given him this presence, this ability to charm the king the way he does? Something must have happened when you put those antlers on his head because now the king thinks that Hearn is his favourite and he does not have time of day for any of us. He will not do us any favours. He will not give us any more land. No, it is all about Hearn. And the lords and the barons, they stood in the house of the druid and they said, we demand that you do something about this. Well, said the druid, there is little that I can do. You are correct. The strength has come from that stag. Hearn has taken it for himself because that is what he needed to heal. Now, there is just one thing, but it is a dark magic. It is a binding spell. And if you really want, I can do that. But do be careful for you do not know what consequences this magic will have, and I do not know. The lords and the barons, they whispered amongst themselves and they decided that, yes, this was what they wanted. They wanted this dark magic performed and hang the costs. And so the druid picked up that skin and the antlers that he had sewn to Hearn's head, that had this connection with Hearn now. He picked up those antlers and he bound those antlers in thick, Blackthorn. 
he rubbed baneful herbs into them and he muttered words of dark magic. The lords and the barons, they sat and they waited until the druid said, it is done. You may return to the court and you may live with whatever happens. So the lords and the barons, they did. They walked back through the forest and they went back to the palace and they watched. They watched as the days and the weeks and the months rolled by and they watched as every time that Hearn went out with William, William could no longer catch deer. He failed with every hunt he went on. And soon William began to look at Hearn differently, not as a charm, but as a curse. Eventually the king, frustrated that he was no longer successful at a hunt, he turned to Hearn and he said, there is no place for you in this court anymore, you must leave. Hearn could not understand what had happened. He had fallen so quickly from grace. It was not his fault the king could not catch the stag or the deer. They had clearly learnt where the king went. The king would not listen to what he now saw as his curse of a gamekeeper. He said to Hearn, You were such luck once, such luck to me, and I know that you laid down your life for me. But now, every time that I go to hunt with you, I catch nothing. You are a curse upon this court, and I cannot have you here any longer. So you will leave and you will go. You are no use to me any more. Hearn could not believe the words that he was hearing. He felt wretched and disgraced. This was his whole reason for being. He was the king's gamekeeper. He had been the king's gamekeeper's son, and his father had been the gamekeeper's son. For generations they had been gamekeepers for royalty and now King William was telling him that laying down his life was not enough and by some twist of fate he had become a curse. And so it was that Hearn did not spend another moment in that court and instead he left and went out into Windsor Forest. He walked into the deepest, darkest part of the forest where the big oak tree stood and he looked up at the oak tree and he shouted, Why? Why has this happened to me? No answer came from the forest. And so Hearn, he took a rope, he made a noose and he threw it over the branch of a tree. The next day a crowd gathered around the oak tree. The sight of the grotesque bloated body of Hearn was too much for anyone to turn their eyes away from. They could not understand how this had happened. The lords and the barons, they stood too and felt some guilt for what had happened. For the druid had told them that he did not know how this would play out. Even King William felt some remorse. They took Hearn's body down from the tree and they placed it on the outskirts of the graveyard where all those who have taken their lives are placed. They mourned for the loss of Hearn. But they did move on and they continued to hunt in those forests. And it is said that if the king's hunting party was ever out too late, in that dusk, that liminal space between day and night, they would hear the thundering of hooves that were not with theirs and they would see the spectral being of Hearn with those antlers attached to his head and he would ride with them and they could not shake him. And as each one of those barons and lords passed on, it is said that they too joined Hearn, and they became a ghoulish, wild hunt. And still to this day, they haunt Great Windsor Park, a warning to us all of the magic that the land holds. Thank you for joining me in the forest for this episode. As always, reviews are enormously helpful. So if you enjoyed the podcast, please do leave me a review either on Apple iTunes or via my Facebook page. Both are very welcome and they really help me to grow my audience for the podcast. As always, you can find me on Instagram at dd underscore storyteller, on Facebook as dd storyteller and on Twitter again as dd underscore storyteller. 
I do hope to see you there as I would love to tell you another story. And of course, I will be back in the new year, if not before, with the next episode of season four. And of course, some news of my new venture. Until then, I'll see you next time. Toodle pip. Toodle pip.